So welcome um, to today's Talk Tuesday. Today we're going to be talking about youth and nicotine and we're going to be discussing the risks of vaping and addiction. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Amema Ataya. I'm ASD school doctor and I'm a pediatrician by training. So um, by the end of today's talk, the learning goals for today are to try to understand what is it about vaping that makes it so attractive to kids. Um, what are the new tobacco products on the market? Just so parents are familiar with what they um, now, many of them look like. Um, let's uh, also discuss what are the signs and symptoms of vaping. It, we know it's very easy to hide a vape pen, so how, how will I recognize that maybe that, that my child has a problem or is vaping? Um, we're gonna learn what the health risks of vaping are, both the known proven ones and the potential um, health risks. And the most important part probably for parents is what can I do um, to help prevent ever use of vaping and smoking. And so we're gonna have some suggestions about how to talk to your kids about vaping. And maybe your child comes to you and says, you know what, I think I'm dependent and I really want to quit. And so what local resources do we have available online, in person, to help uh, students who are interested in quitting? So why is vaping so prevalent and why does it continue to grow um, uh, to the point where people are calling it the new teen epidemic? Um, it's mainly because we think a, a main driving force is the advertising that is intentionally directed to attract kids to try and experiment um, with these devices. They have started as early as when Juul came out, which was back um, in 2016, with ads that are really uh, modern, um, geometric designs. Um, they package the devices um, where they look very different than a traditional cigarette, so it's something more modern and, and uh, um, interesting to a, a teenager. But also the packaging, um, and you'll see over the last several years, has become very um, geared towards exactly colorful, cartoon, cool. Um, and um, they have in their ads uh, messages that make uh, kids want to experiment with it. So a young, cool person uh, vaping. Um, this is a, a poster from a vape store here in Dubai. I, you might have seen it, um, but it shows all the different colors and all the different flavors. And just the, um, the line, the, the motto that it tries to say vaping and smoking are not the same. Vaping is um, a, a lifestyle. It's something very attractive. And if you can see this marketing technique, um, what it might do to an adult, let alone a child who is, um, their brain is still developing, um, they're very curious, they still don't have their um, uh, executive functioning lobes all developed, and so they might say, oh, you know what, it's not so bad, I, I think I wanna go ahead and try this. Um, and it's not easy, uh, it's, let's say it's, it's quite easy to access. It's, um, there's not a mall in Dubai that you would go to these days that you don't find a vape store, if not one or two. Even in uh, DXB uh, airport, there are vape stores. So they're, they're prevalent and we all know also you can access them quite easily over the internet. So um, I gave a lot of talks over the last few years to our students and um, a lot of them uh, this question they get wrong that most e-cigarettes contain nicotine a lot of kids um, and this is again I think a lot to do with the marketing and advertising think that vape pens some of them don't have nicotine and that's not true almost all vape pens contain nicotine um, and in fact if you measured the amount of uh, nicotine in the uh, el um, electronic liquid that's in a typical vape pen it's the equivalent of 20 traditional cigarettes so a whole pack um, of uh, cigarettes. And so I just wanted to review a few um, facts. What is an electronic cigarette? You might hear them refer to as so many different things, vape pen, vape device, mod, pod, but basically they all fall under a derivative of a tobacco product. So, it's, um, so you have the traditional cigarettes and then you have all these electronic devices. And they're basically battery powered. They have a liquid in them that gets heated up by a battery and then the liquid turns from a liquid to a gas when it, um, it, it gets heated up. And that aerosolized vapor is what people are inhaling. And that is full of all kinds of things we'll learn about later, but mainly it does contain nicotine, which is the main addictive substance. Um, as we talked about before, the attraction to this is that it's um, packaged in colorful um, designs. It has 
15,000 plus flavors on the market, all kinds of combinations of candies and fruits, um, which make this really appealing to, uh, to young people. And even though different drug regulatory bodies have tried to ban this, they find ways around it. So even though they have recently banned flavors in uh, vape pens, well, disposables are allowed to still have it. So, well, what did the kids do? They just switch over to disposable um, devices. So vaping is worse than uh, smoking an actual cigarette? Um, because it has 20 cigarettes. Yes, in a way you can say that. That's true. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and when they did a lot of surveys in the UK, in the US, and then I have some just data from our school, definitely vape, vaping and electronic cigarettes have far surpassed um, traditional cigarettes in terms of the most commonly used tobacco product um, in young people from 2014. It's been um, globally, you can say in general, the most commonly used um, you know, tobacco product. The scary thing is that if a teenager or a, you know, a preteen starts vaping, they are three times more likely to become uh, cigarette smokers. So they transition later on in adulthood to cigarette smokers. And almost all people who are adults who smoke or um, use cigarettes, tobacco products, they started before they were age eight, they were 18 years old. So that's why you mentioned you have elementary school students. I'm so, I want every elementary, elementary two. Elementary two. Yeah, this, this is great because you, you want to, exactly, we, we want to prevent. So we need to start talking to kids before 11 because that's when um, the access is there, the experimenting, and, and that's when they, they're starting, unfortunately. So we want to send all the um, messages, all the uh, positive messages about why it's important to not you know, start going down that road early, early on. Um, so just to give you an idea of a number, in a, in a country as, as large as the United States, and this, I'm only quoting CDC data because we have it at our fingertips, over three million um, teenagers uh, use tobacco products. Um, this was in 2022. Electronic cigarettes are the most popular, and for the combustible or the ones, you know, traditional, let's say, cigars, where I thought that was interesting. I didn't realize that. I think that just speaks to how popular vapes are um, compared to cigarettes. So uh, this is UK data. You can see the blue line shows um, that vaping is way more popular in young people um, between 11 and 17-year-olds than traditional cigarettes. And what about ASD? So in September of this year, we did an anonymous survey um, for all of the uh, grade levels in the high school division. Um, we felt it was quite accurate because it truly was anonymous. We encourage people to try to answer these questions as honestly as possible. And the goal of it was obviously not punitive and we were not going to try to figure out who was vaping. There was no, there was no consequence except we wanted to know how prevalent it was at ASD and what we could do to support um, teens both in educating so that um, kids who might be experiencing peer pressure, you know, to try to um, educate them on how they can navigate that. But then also if kids did recognize that they might be addicted, um, where they can go for help. And so um, this just shows that all the grade levels were pretty equally represented um, out of almost 600 responses. Um, about 25% um, of the responses were for, from each grade level. So each grade level was equally represented in the data that you'll see. Um, and so we asked, have you, have you ever tried vaping? Most kids have not, okay, in high school. 83% um, have not. About 15 to 16 percent um, not only have tried vaping, but they, you'll find out later, they, they do vape. And so this, this is important because it actually matches almost exactly with um, the United States data and the UK data that came out um, uh, in 2022 that shows that um, about 15 to 16 percent of high school students vape. Um, and our school is, is not different. Um, but what's interesting is that people have the perception that everybody is vaping and that they're the only ones who are not vaping. So when you ask the students, do you think everyone is vaping? Are people vaping more? Almost all of them think, like 47% think yes, people are definitely more people are vaping. And the other 40% don't really know. But it's just interesting, the perception is that um, they're, they're, they're the only ones who are not vaping, the ones who don't vape. But actually most kids are not vaping. Um, and most do not do it at school, um, and probably because of the policies um, and the serious infractions if they are caught at school, um, and not many opportunities, but anyway, it does happen, and um, 
and we can talk about that later. Um, I think what's interesting is that a lot of people don't know what it means when vaping starts controlling their lives. So what is an addiction? And we actually had to explain to kids what does addiction mean, what does dependence mean? Because they might say, yeah, I vape, but I'm in control. I can decide when I want to stop, I could stop. But in fact, they, um, you'll, you'll find out later that when we ask them how many times do you use in a day, 81% use it more than five times. So that speaks to some high degree of dependence that they use it that often in the day. So I'm not so sure how in control they really are, but they have the perception that they're in control of it and that they're not addicted. Um, so if they've tried vaping, where do they get their vape pens? Most of them get it from friends. So what does the UAE say? What is the tobacco law? And I think this is really important and we, I have this slide for the kids as well because Unfortunately, I think to justify vaping, because it, we know that it, when it did originally come out, it was marketed to help people who wanted to quit smoking, so it really came from a positive angle. I think, a unfortunately, uh, the feeling about vaping is that it's much safer, and, so, um, and that vaping and smoking are not the same. They really try to draw that distinction because I think it then um, helps encourage younger people to say, well, it's not such a big deal, it's more natural. Um, but actually, the UAE does not distinguish between them. Smoking and uh, smoking, uh, traditional cigarettes and vaping are both illegal for kids under 18. They're, it's illegal. They're, and they're not, it's illegal to sell it to them as well. Um, we know that the problem is they can order it on the internet or get it for, through family and friends, but it is illegal um, for someone under 18 to be um, uh, smoking or vaping. And whether, even if you're an adult, there are places that you're not allowed to smoke or vape. So public places where there might be families and children, like malls, parks, beaches, um, healthcare facilities, uh, schools, um, and places of worship. And as we mentioned before, middle school and high school in the handbook, um, if you are, have a middle schooler, you'll find it on page 37. In high school, it's on page 10. It's very clear, and the students do know where it is. Um, in, if they were found um, vaping or smoking at ASD, or on an ASD-sponsored trip or event, or even wearing the uniform and representing ASD, um, they can be um, held responsible and accountable, and there are some very serious consequences for students, including suspensions and such. So we're not trying to scare the kids, but we think they need to know when they enter middle school and high school what will happen if they are um, found vaping in the bathroom or whatever. So you can feel free to review these with your kids at home so that they know the um, consequences. So what are these new tobacco products, the, the new vapes? What might they be referred to as? Because sometimes when you say, do you vape? They're like, no, I use mods. Well, like, it's important to know that they're all part of the same beast. So vape pen, electronic cigarette, an electronic cigar, electronic hookah even, mechanical mods, pods, personal vaporizers. These all refer to electronic, different types of electronic cigarettes. So how did they evolve? Um, so you have, uh, the first generation that looked very similar to a traditional cigarette. Um, it was um, uh, a much smaller dose, let's say, of nicotine because it's not a refillable reservoir. It had a low voltage battery. It heated up the liquid, aerosolized, and looked just like a traditional cigarette. These were not that popular. They came out in the US market um, about 15 years ago. Um, the second generation electronic cigarettes were uh, more interesting because they started to think of the concept of flavoring them, coming in, um, you know, marketing them in different colors. And this did have a reservoir that could be refilled with the um, uh, electronic liquid. And you could also have different concentrations of nicotine um, in your, in your uh, device. Third generation was even more customizable, where you could, um, you know, get your uh, personal vaporizer and adjust all the settings so they were sort of just right for you. How much nicotine, um, depending on how uh, quickly it was heated, um, and um, how much nicotine liquid, the concentration you would put in it, etc. So these started to really take off. But then I think when we really started to see the exponential rise is when these devices came onto the market, like the Juul or Soren, um, because they looked nothing like a traditional cigarette. And they were the most, let's say, deviating from um, uh, smoking, um, the concept of smoking. So they looked like flash drives or um, batteries or whatnot. And, um, oh, sorry, so back here. And they came in all kinds of flavors. 
And as I mentioned, um, the regulatory bodies were really lagging behind, uh, recognizing that these needed to be um, more strictly regulated for kids. And so eventually, yes, they started to say, okay, well, you can't flavor these because kids enjoy them and, and it's promoting um, use at a younger age. So then disposables started to become very popular. And these are, at the moment are not regulated. They, these can be sold in all their different colors and flavors. And it's not surprising that they are the most commonly used vape device among kids. And the, the most common brand is Puff Bar. And I just wanted to show this, that even hookahs um, just, you know, came up with the concept that, well, if vaping is the, you know, wave of the future, then we'll come up with electronic hookahs. So th these are, those exist too. I just thought that was very interesting. I haven't seen anyone use them, but um, even so they... It's an argili but electronic, yeah, oh where you fill it. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just, I can't believe that. Um, so you can see here, this is our students, uh, high school students, almost, um, let's say, more than 55% uh, use disposables. I don't know what the others are. It's followed by others, but they were not one of the choices we gave. So I, I'm interested to know what's the other vape product that they use. I'm not sure. But disposable is the... Um, most popular. So you, we talked about how vape devices are really sneaky. They can look like anything. So how would you know that maybe there's a problem that maybe your child is, is vaping? Um, one of the telltale signs is the smell. Okay, so I think you mentioned how it's, you know, it's traditional cigarettes, you can smell it. It's very hard to hide that. But vape pens, um, you know, they, they smell very fruity. You might have minty scents coming from closed doors or bathrooms where people are hiding. Um, that's one way, you know, when, when we walk down the hallways, we are kind of thinking about that as we're walking. Do we need to go in and check uh, what's going on in there? We're smelling some smells coming out. So the fruity smells is one sign. If you notice, I mean, when you're going through your kids' things in their backpacks, if you're noticing something that um, is a device you don't recognize, maybe it looks like a, a garage opener. You're like, hmm, this doesn't, this doesn't look like something that should be in your bag, or a strange-looking battery, or any weird-looking device that um, you can question them. Like, what is this for? Uh, because they can look even like a pen. Um, and I was reading that not a long ago, they came up with even designing them to look like an asthma inhaler. So you would know as the parent whether or not you packed an asthma inhaler. So if you see some weird looking, um, you know, medicine device, uh, you know that it's probably a vape pen. Um, what might they look like physically? Because the um, vapors are so irritating to the mucosa of the eyes and mouth, you might see that they're their eyes are bloodshot, um, especially right after using, and they might try to mask that with lots of uh, eye drops to soothe the eyes. Um, they might complain a lot of headaches, um, coughing, and that can be uh, short-term effects of, of um, vaping, but also some withdrawal uh, symptoms. So when we'll talk later about nicotine dependence, but unfortunately it's uh, so easy to develop nicotine dependence with, with vape pens that uh, if it's been a few hours since the last time they've used, they might start to um, have some of these physical symptoms of withdrawal, like feeling shaky, feeling um, headache, nauseous. Um, and then the behavioral signs can be quite uh, obvious. Although most teenagers can be irritable and moody, this would be a, a change in their normal behavior. Feeling more anxious, feeling more impulsive. Um, and then you might notice that they're asking for a lot of money and they, you can't, they're not buying anything that you can see with it. So unexplained spending can be a red flag. Or that their, their performance drops, whether it's in school with their grades or academic performance or in sports. Because it does affect both their um, concentration, memory, their brain, as well as their, um, their physical, respiratory, and cardiovascular health. So the change in performance is something to take note of. Um, so what are the health effects of vaping? So again, some teens might say, well, there, it's so much safer than cigarettes that, you know, it's not a big deal, it's natural, um, and it, it, you know, what's the harm in it? And you can uh, go to the CDC to show them this plume of smoke and everything that they're inhaling when they take one um, puff of their vape pen. Everything from nicotine, which we'll talk about later, uh, how it is a, literally a brain poison, 
different ultra-fine particles that we don't know the effect of. These tiny particles are going into the smallest airways and depositing there. And these are young kids. We don't know in 30 years what damage that's doing to their lungs. There are heavy metals like lead, tin, nickel. Um, known carcinogens like formaldehyde, which are also in traditional cigarettes. They are also in vape devices. And then the flavorings they use, which smell so nice and are so attractive, actually are um, potentially very, very harmful. Some of the harms we already know about, um, one particular flavoring called diacetyl causes a very serious lung disease that's not even reversible. And then um, some of the flavors that um, these kids are inhaling, we don't know what, um, what long-term effects it might have on their lungs. So this is important. Um, this, this slide I will definitely show the kids, um, and I've shown them before in, in the different talks that we give, that we know that in the, in the near term, um, when someone smokes or vapes, that there is a pleasurable feeling. And that's the, that is lasting them a few minutes of this kind of energized feeling, of able to concentrate, and this relaxed feeling kind of at the same time. So. Um, that's sort of the immediate effect. But what happens later, we'll talk about with nicotine dependence, is that you require a larger amount of nicotine in order to feel and achieve that same state of calm and energized. Um, and so this is um, harming the brain because it's actually changing the circuitry and causing uh, substance dependence. The, um, all those aerosolized um, vapors can irritate the mouth and the eyes, um, can cause coughing, uh, asthma symptoms like chest tightness, um, uh, inflammation in the lungs. It can affect the blood vessels, it can affect the heart, it can cause blood clots. Um, and so, and, oh, and long term, of course, we know uh, that there, um, cancer, it increases our, risk, our risks of cancer. Um, so back to nicotine and why this is especially important to talk to your kids about is that um, nicotine is a known brain poison, and kids' brains are especially susceptible, both because they're still developing. We know that kids' brains continue to develop till they're 25 years old, but also because um, nicotine causes an abnormal release of that pleasurable hormone uh, called dopamine. And so it's important for them to understand that, yes, it might feel good in the minute, but what it's doing is unnatural. It's changing the way your brain chemistry works, and that can actually be irreversible and can increase risk for other um, uh, problems, um, especially mental health problems such as anxiety, um, able to, um, the inability to regulate uh, your mood, um, being impulsive, and actually can open the door or the circuitry of the brain, making someone more prone to become dependent on other substances like alcohol or other drugs. And then um, for kids who really care about, which all of our kids I think at ASC care about the, uh, their learning, it seems in the moment, well, I can concentrate so much better, but no, in the, in, in the longer run, it's actually negatively impacting your ability to retain, um, to retain memories, to learn, to concentrate. It negatively affects your learning. Um, and this uh, just got published end of January, which um, is an article that showed that teenagers who use um, alcohol and nicotine are more likely to have underlying psychiatric symptoms. And it actually, what was interesting is even low levels of use um, that still increase their risk for having um, mental health issues. And then this one uh, is um, the one that scares kids the most. A battery uh, in a vape device can explode in, in someone's face and break the teeth and um, you know, damage their mouth. Uh, also, sometimes uh, little toddlers are in the house and can get their hands on the e-liquid that are the, what you use to refill your vape device with. And actually, kids' um, ER visits have gone up exponentially since uh, vape devices have um, been on the market because kids, um, it smells great. It smells like candy. They might drink it. And the, as we talked about, the amount of nicotine in that can cause acute nicotine poisoning, even death, especially in a young kid. And then there's the second and third hand exposure, which um, is important to uh, um, recognize that we can be harming our kids just by having them be in a room where someone else is smoking or vaping because of second and third hand exposure. That's, that's, that, that's what I was thinking, like, <coughs> sitting next to somebody, next to somebody and yeah. they just vaping, and I'm like, no, it's yeah. not going and we the same thing. Yeah. Because and adults, it doesn't serve that That's same, right. Uh, and it's one thing if you're an adult, but I think when you're in a place where you don't 
you feel like you don't have control over what maybe your, your, the, our children are inhaling, that's hard because we know that, that this is also a stage where they're developing and the harm, um, the damage that it's doing to their lungs from second head exposure, it's very important to recognize that. Third is, uh, it would be in pregnancy, so someone who, a fetus who's being exposed um, to uh, um, smoke or vape vapors in utero, that has been also linked to lung disease and such. So, um, what can we do to help? So let's focus on, the, on what we can do. Um, so again, starting early, we want to uh, really focus on prevention, but then we also want to know, we want our kids to know that we are here for them and we're here to support them. Um, we are here to help them recognize maybe some of the signs that we're like, you know what, we think you're not in, in control of this um, as, as much as you think, but we're here to help you if you want to quit and let's go get help. And, and um, I'm going to share with you some resources for that. So as a parent, as a teacher, um, we can educate ourselves because if we have the information, then we can uh, share it with our kids. They're, the kids will share it with their friends and we will create a culture who is well aware of the fact that vaping and smoking are you know, two heads of the same snake. They are both bad for our health and they, are both, they both have risks. And in fact, vaping has unique risks that traditional cigarettes don't have. We don't need to compare which is worse. They both are not okay for your health. So we don't want you to do either. <laughs> and let, this is why, and you, you would be able to explain to them. Um, you wanna explain to them how their brains also work because I think kids, um, especially our kids here, they can understand the science behind the neurochemistry. You can show them the picture of the brain. You can talk about dopamine. This is why do people vape? Yes, they like the feeling in the minute, but then look what it does. Look at how it changes your entire brain pathways and sets you up for all these problems, you know, later on in life. Um, and it's, it's okay to start talking about your kids as early as 9, 10. There's, you know, it's saying vape pen is not gonna make them wonder what it is and wanna try it. So talk to them about, um, about all kinds of substances early on so that they're aware, so that you don't get to the point where you're like, oh, I didn't get the chance to have that talk and now they've, their friend already offered them one and they didn't know what to do about it. Yes. Not at all. Yes. Like we were being so polite, you don't want to scare them, but it's like you don't want to scare them. But if you don't tell them, how how are they going to know? That's exactly right. So it's not scary. Maybe it's just uh, if you say it, educating. But like, educating as well, and then I, we'll talk later about um, a podcast that I want everyone to listen to by Dr. Lisa Demore, who's a psychiatrist, and she talks about how um, if the Talk, just talking to them and saying, I really don't want you to do this, may or may not work. Some teens really need to have another strategy to decide whether or not they're going to go down this path, and it's more putting them against the industry who is manipulating them. So we'll talk about using that strategy too, because I think for um, especially the older teenagers, sometimes it's not that you're telling them it's bad for that's not going to work. So you might you need multiple strategies to reach some kids. So you're right. Keep educating. Keep telling them you don't want this for them because these are the reasons. But then also, um, you know, let them know that, you know, help lift that veil that um, makes them think that this is all that's that it's okay. Say no. This is all strategies from big billion dollar industries that want to hook you young and want to keep you addicted so that they have. You know, um, they have a whole generation of people who got hooked early and then will continue to buy their products. So that sometimes also works because teenagers are cynical <laughs> of um, big corporations. So whatever strategy can work for and every kid, even in your own family, every kid is different. Um, you, could, you might need to use some um, different ways of talking to them to reach them at different stages also of their development. But yes, it starts with education and, and reminding them of the health risks. And then um, we set, uh, we set, we try to set very good examples. We want to, we want to not use um, vapes or smoke in front of the kids because they want to model after our, um, our, um, you know, their role models, their parents. And so we want to advocate that the house should always be smoke free, so that also they are not exposed to secondhand smoke as much as we can. Um, in reality, advertising has a, a, a more powerful effect than whether a parent smokes or not, just so you are um, aware of that. So also advocating that 
we do more to not allow for this kind of um, uh, children targeting in advertising because actually they are more influenced by social media and um, uh, yeah, advertising than their own parents unfortunately but at the same time um, you know it's important to model uh, what we want for our kids okay so um, we said we want to talk to them early starting from 9 10 11 years old teach them refusal skills so they will be faced not just with try this vape pen but it might be try this or try that so we want to let them um, practice the even role play the the language that they would say no I don't want to I you know they're not there to lecture their friends but for them to be empowered to stand up and say no I don't want to try that you know I I care about soccer too much I really don't want anything to affect my lungs whatever line that feels natural for them that they can practice and that they that you empower them to use there will be and let them know there will be situations where people might you might feel pressured in order to stay part of this friendship group that you have to do this or that. Um, so let them know that it's okay to refuse. Um, let them know what you want for them because in the end, yes, their friendships matter a lot, but you know, if you are very clear about your expectations, then that also matters. Like you said, you're, you, you knew your parents' expectation was that, that you weren't going to, it wasn't even an option. <laughs> So it, it, it matters, exactly. it, it matters what um, your parents say they want for you. Even if they smoke, they say, but I don't want that for you. You know, I really want you, I don't want you to cough the way, whatever it is, but be honest with them and let them know what you want for them. It's kind of separate from what you do as an adult in a way, um, but letting them really clearly and honestly know that what, what your expectations are for them. Um, we talked about the manipulation piece, so you know um, this is all tr tricks of the industry to get you, oh, yeah. to get you early. But the end gets <clears throat> really like, you know, yeah. Those, those energy drinks, Prime, drinks. yeah, as well. Small yes. Yeah. But they know about it before. I mean, I learned about Prime from a student. I didn't even know what it yeah. was. Okay. I, I learned first from them, and then I said, oh, Prime. I had to Google it. You know, this was a couple of years ago when it first came out. Uh, so sometimes they are, they are introduced before we have the chance to even know whether we should be re recommending it or not. Like, wait a second, what is it? Let me see how many milligrams of caffeine. Oh, no, this is not OK. Um, and then, you know, if you're having these honest conversations and you're letting them know that, you know, you're, you, you're with them, you're with them. It's not, you're not, there's, this is not a punishment thing. You need help. It's not your fault. If you're dependent on nicotine, this is a condition. I'm going to help you. We're going to get help for you. We're going to try this. We're going to try, we're going to see this um, psychologist or this doctor to help you. I'm so glad you want to quit and I'm going to help you do it. We don't need consequences when someone comes up and says, I need support now. I want. I don't. I don't want this for myself. I. I did it, but I want. I want moving forward. I want to stop. I want to reduce it or whatever. So we want to team up with our kids, and we're done saying I told you so. We need to help them now, um, and try to have a smoke-free environment uh, as much as possible in your home. So this was the podcast I was talking about, and she has a whole series. They, um, and she actually did a live session at ASD last year or two years ago, um, a Zoom, a live Zoom session. Um, it was fantastic. I really loved this particular podcast, How Do I Talk My Teen Out of Vaping? So just encourage you guys to listen to that. It's not very long. And she has a couple others, a follow-up uh, um, regarding um, uh, how to empower our kids to navigate these difficult situations when faced with vaping and other, other substances. Um, and these are the quitting apps. So a lot of kids may not, um, you know, they're very used to using technology and apps um, for whatever it is in their life, whether it's, you know, calming strategies, whatever it is, uh, to fall asleep at night. Well, there are quitting apps that they can actually design a quit plan all on their app. And this can be very attractive to young people who are so used to using their devices. Um, because going to see a doctor or going to see a psychologist um, to quit might just, you know, you might not, um, you know, kind of get them on board with that. Yeah, exactly. And this is a nice way to start, and they're very effective. Um, so here are a few examples um, of some free online apps. Um, this one I really like, Become a Smoke-Free Teen. It um, has a tool where you build your own quit plan. Um, you choose your quit date. You find out why you want to quit. What are the reasons? Um, it's affecting my health. Um, I want to save money. I, I want to, and it could, obviously, for many kids, it's a lot of reasons. 
Um, and then you try to think about um, what the triggers could be and try to avoid those, either social situations or um, uh, times where you might feel that you are um, motivated to want to use again and try to find another coping strategy for those times um, and encouraging self-care in general so exercising eating well, sleeping well obviously all those things are important to increase um, that child's success in their quitting um, journey so out of the kids who vape um, about 35 percent want recognize that they are dependent and they want to quit and the good news is most of them know where to get help. About 68% feel like they um, know where to go to find out um, uh, you know, where they can get support or a resource, which was, which was nice. I wish it was all of them, that they knew they could come to the health office or to their counselor or to their parents. Um, but um, at least most of them do recognize that we're here to help them if they, if, if they need it. So. Um, Key points, just before we wrap up, is that vaping is prevalent, okay, um, and kids are starting younger and younger, um, that the big uh, tobacco companies are targeting young people, specifically, um, using uh, flavors and um, cool packaging, that all kinds of electronic uh, cigarettes and devices are unsafe. Talk to your kids early, honestly, um, about the health effects of vaping. Um, trying to prevent them from ever using. But um, if they have started using and they recognize that they're dependent and they're interested in quitting, um, please encourage them to uh, get support, whether it's um, through an online app or through a, a psychologist or a therapist in the community. Um, I always put my email address up here um, for the kids um, and you guys can email the health office anytime if there's anyone that you know who's looking for help um, and I can send a list of that's some fantastic uh, psychologists in our community who deal with addiction and specifically with teens and can be really helpful. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. And you. Bye-bye.